you very much again. Um, I do want to share the work that amazing parents are doing right now. So Amara, of course, works with hundreds of amazing families and parents every year in their foster care program and also the post-adoption services. So today, we are very fortunate to hear from one of these parents. And if I can, get a round of applause for Morgan Larson as she makes her way up here. It was a Friday afternoon in February 2017 when we received an email referral from the Amara Child Placement Coordinator for little boy, age two. The email referral ended with a request. If you are willing to offer your home for as long as this boy needs one, please let me know as soon as you can. That phrase is poignant to me because I distinctly remember the perspective I had when my husband and I went to our first Amara information meeting. Before we walked in, I was sure that the right child for us would be a child who was ready to be adopted. A child in that circumstance would disrupt our family the least because we wouldn't have to worry about the child ever leaving our home. However, at that first Amara meeting, we were encouraged to think about fostering a child who was new to the system, who had an unknown future. You don't know how long that child will stay, but your home will be the only place they will have to go outside of their first home. I learned that every time a child moves, that move is a traumatic event and can have a lasting effect for a child. It dawned on me that I had been thinking about what would result in the least amount of trauma for myself and for my family. But what about the child's trauma? And so when the request came to offer our home, to a two-year-old boy as long as he needed it, we said yes. And that evening, a sad little boy, Brady, arrived at our door. He walked in, he put his head on the floor, and he cried. Brady arrived with a bag of possessions, including pictures of the relative caregivers that had been taking care of him. He came with a letter from those caregivers, asking that we take good care of him, and then I cried too. The social worker told us that they were looking at a suitable other placement, someone that Brady already knew. So there was a good chance he would only be with us through the weekend. That left us two days to make him as comfortable and as happy as possible. We quickly found that our own two children were the best remedy for his sadness. Our seven-year-old son, Elliot, set up his train track, and together the two boys played trains. Our four-year-old daughter, Kate, offered her a room to share, and Brady's crib was set up alongside her bed. Because we were called mom and dad by Brady and Kate, we were instantly, by Elliot and Kate, we were instantly called mom and dad by Brady. And at night, all tucked in, with the light off and the night light on, Brady would remind me of my new, if temporary, role. As soon as I walked out of the bedroom, he would call after me, Mama, sit. And I would come and sit in the doorway so he could see me from the crib, see I wasn't going anywhere, and eventually fall asleep. On Monday, we received a call that the placement the state had planned on would first need to complete a home study. That meant that Brady wouldn't be going anywhere for at least three months, possibly more. Two days later, we received another phone call as it turned out, the suitable other wasn't going to be a viable placement, and Brady was ours to adopt after we had fostered for six months. We were in shock at so much rapid change. Our social worker advised us to focus on adjusting to our new family of five. And that the most important thing was to bond as a family. I was grateful for the advice, and I found it was necessary as well. It took all of my energy to create a new normal for our family. At the same time, I thought a lot about where Brady had come from, the relatives he had lived with before coming to live with us. Because they were extended family, the law did not require visits. And we did not take any initiative to make contact. 
I knew nothing about them except for the letter and pictures that had arrived with Brady, and while I wondered about his family, I was grateful more than once that we didn't have to complicate our own family dynamic with additional people. That changed four months later when we received news that one of Brady's previous caregivers, his aunt, was quite sick and she wanted to have a visit with Brady. I felt that of course we had to meet her and the other family that was sure to come along, but I worried about it. I didn't want to think about the feelings and concerns of this other family. So it was with a certain amount of trepidation that I met the family tomorrow on a June day in 2017. Brady's aunt and his grandfather and his great uncle were waiting for us, waving from the window of one of the visiting rooms. There were tears and hugs, and Grandpa brought his guitar to play some of Brady's favorite songs. I struggled with so many emotions that day. When we arrived, Brady wouldn't leave my lap, and I felt guilty about that, and I was filled with anxiety that he would call me mom in front of his aunt, who he used to call mom. I was, I was so happy to see them, and I was also happy to wave goodbye, grateful that there were no set plans to see them again. As we left, I gave the family a new email address I had recently created so that they could send pictures and notes to Brady, and they started writing almost immediately. Although I had the ability to turn off the email forwarding, I couldn't bring myself to. I read every email. Most were directed to Brady, little updates about the dog or pictures from before he joined our family. It was clear that they loved him. Sometimes the family sent emails directed to me that made it clear they wanted to spend more time with him. At one point, I was asked directly why I wasn't making it possible for them to see Brady more. Why was I keeping him from them? I felt caught in the middle, like I was the bad guy. I didn't know what to think, what to do. I didn't want to deal with this additional complication to our lives. I felt both guilty that I wasn't advocating for more visits with his family and relieved that legally I could avoid them completely if I wanted to. As I struggled to navigate what I was feeling and reconcile it with what action I should take, our social worker at Amara introduced us to Diane an attachment therapist who specializes in foster and adoptive families. During the first meeting in our home with Diane, I shared all of my concerns, and I remember her listening to our story in her quiet, measured response. She was of the opinion that Brady's family was grieving, that they were unsure of what future they would have with Brady, and it was difficult for them. They were reaching out to me, complaining to me out of a place of love. They didn't know what else to do. I thought back to my original reasons for wanting to foster. I wanted to give a child what I believe family should provide, safety and opportunity and love. But our immediate family of five were not the only ones who loved Brady. There was an entirely other group of people who loved him. Wasn't it important that he know that? I put aside my concerns and I trusted in Diane. Brady needed this love in his life. At this point, Brady's adoption had been finalized. As his legal guardians, it was our responsibility to take the first steps in creating a relationship with Brady's extended family. Diane suggested we could start building a foundation of trust and the beginnings of a healthy relationship by creating a plan to communicate and by following through consistently on that plan. I loved that idea but I had no idea how to execute. That is when we met Kara from Amara's post-adoption program. It's hard to explain the relief I felt that there was someone who could help us take the first steps in navigating this relationship. Kara coordinated a first meeting at the Amara office where she was the neutral party that listened to what both families wanted and helped us create a schedule for visits and for other forms of contact. Our first visit was scheduled for the following week. One of the terms we set at this initial meeting was the way we would communicate. I wasn't ready to communicate directly with the family, so to confirm our playground play date, I reached out to Kara, who reached out to the family, who then reached back out to Kara, who reached back out to me. <clears throat> it sounds laborious. It was laborious. But the knowledge that Kara was facilitating contact gave me the peace of mind that I wasn't doing this alone. 
someone else who had done this before was helping our families to navigate this new terrain. The first couple of meetings with Brady's extended family were at a neutral location. We awkwardly spent a few hours together sharing stories and following Brady around. I had asked that the family stop using the email address I had given them and to email Kara instead. We passed pictures and emails back and forth through Kara. I learned more about Brady's grandma who had passed away shortly before he came to live with us and how hard her passing had been on the family. I learned about grandpa's passion for the guitar and how he played in the church band. Eight months <clears throat> after that first post-adoption visit at the playground, grandpa invited us to a ha his house, a place where Brady had spent much of his first two years before he came to us. I reached out to Kara to get her perspective on going and she shared that of course it was up to us, but it could be a great next step in building trust. We went to grandpa's house in April. The kids played with the dog. His family made us lunch. As I sat in their living room, watching the kids play, I thought about how normal the scene looked. Just some extended family getting together. That visit at grandpa's house was the last time Kara facilitated our contact. After months of positive communication through past emails and consistent visits, we had created the foundation of trust that we needed to communicate directly. At the beginning of those eight months, I never would have imagined we could have formed the relationship or formed the trust we would need to have a healthy relationship, especially so quickly. But as we got to know Brady's family, I was impressed how quickly that trust and furthermore that relationship developed. I learned firsthand that during the foster process, they were scared and they were grieving. They knew nothing about the home environment or family that Brady had been placed with and they had lost regular contact with a little boy that they loved deeply. Once we got to know them, I began to see them for who they really were. They were caring, they were concerned, they didn't just buy Christmas gifts for Brady, but for all of our kids. At a Mariners game last April, they brought a special family baseball meant to give, not to Brady, but to our oldest child. We didn't need Kara to facilitate our contact any longer because we had created the trust to proceed on our own. But without Amara's post-adoption program during those first months, I wonder if we would ever have been able to form the relationship that we did. It has now been 18 months since we finalized Brady's adoption. In October last year, I reached out to Diane to ask what she thought about us inviting Brady's family to our house. They hadn't been to our house yet, and I still felt a little weird about having them over. But I knew it would mean so much to Brady to have all of his family in his home. Diane agreed wholeheartedly. Brady turned four in December, and we invited his aunt and grandpa and great uncle to our house to celebrate. I also had family in town and we had friends over from preschool. It was a house full of people who loved Brady. That day, we took a new family picture, Brady with his extended family in our home. What defines a family? I realize now that it is all of us coming together to support a little boy that we love. We are all his family, we are all family. <laughs>